In 1952, a British expedition visited Greenland. The scientists spent two years in this inhospitable place. This was a modern and well-equipped expedition. But even in a modern expedition, dog teams are still used for much of the traveling. At certain times of year, it was necessary to manhandle equipment and stores. Such occurrences as this were fortunately rare. But nevertheless, an expedition such as this was an exciting adventure for those who gave up two years of their life to further man's knowledge of these remote places. Peter Taylor was one of the scientists on this expedition. Greenland is a vast island, 600 miles across and 1,600 miles from north to south. Two-thirds of it lies within the Arctic Circle. Man's discovery of this strange and desolate land has been laborious and slow. Until 1930, it was thought to be a relatively thin ice cap covering a mountainous interior. In that year, Wagner, a German geophysicist, shows that the ice at the center was incredibly thick. But just how thick, and what was the nature of all this ice, remained unknown. Two expeditions, the French one under Paul-Emile Victor in the south, and ours in the north, have since greatly extended our knowledge of the inland ice. We carried out our work in this way. First, we established two bases, one by a lake in Dronning Louise land, where we studied the extent to which the ice and snow was melting away, and the other, up here on the inland ice, we studied the accumulation. Later, a survey party was to try to find out the depths of the snow and ice on a 600-mile traverse right across the whole country. But before all this could begin, there was a lot of groundwork to be done, such as establishing bases and so on. Our stores were initially unloaded in Young Sound, about 200 miles up the east coast of Greenland in July 1952. In polar research work, the main thing to remember is that you have to start from scratch. You have nothing, not even an exploitable natural environment. Near the coast, you can feed your huskies on seal meat, but inland, even that is impossible. So you bring everything with you, vast quantities of fuel, your food, your hut, everything you will need for the duration of your stay. All this was unloaded onto the shore to sort out for the second stage of transportation, that is to Britannia Lake, about 200 miles away. For this job, RAF Sunderlands were flown from Britain. They formed a shuttle service from Young Sound, across the coastal mountains to the new site. This is to be the main base, home for the next two years. As soon as the unloading is underway, the building of the hut is started. The short Arctic summers make speed essential. Everybody helps with the building. There are not many hands, and they are all unskilled. But this is compensated for by the fact that the hut is completely prefabricated. In fact, parties of six to eight men put it up in just over two weeks. But what is more essential than speed or ease of erection is good insulation and for a good reason. In Greenland, winds frequently reach gale force and the temperature may drop to as much as 80 below zero. 
While some work on the main base, now called Britannia Lake, six men with dog teams set off to establish the Inland Ice Station about 250 miles away. This was later called North Ice. Having decided on the site, radio contact is made through Britannia Lake with the large air base at Pula on the west coast. From there, Hastings aircraft fly out to drop supplies. They are talked down to 50 feet by radio, as it is very difficult for a pilot to judge such small heights over snow. More delicate objects are dropped by parachute. As soon as enough materials have been landed, work begins on the hut, which is to be the home of those manning this inland ice station at North Ice. By October, when the sun finally disappears, three men are left to spend the winter there. And then the long polar night began. In our particular latitude, we were without the sun for a matter of about four months. But it was only for a few weeks at midwinter that we had continuous darkness. With the returning light in spring, the scientific program of the expedition, determining how much ice and snow there was in the northern part of Greenland, could begin. I think I can best illustrate it with a diagram. Drawing a cross section of Greenland, coastal mountains in the east, coastal mountains in the west, and the dome of ice in the centre, of course, purely hypothetical at this stage, we've decided, first of all, to find the shape of the surface of the ice, ice above sea level. And also its thickness to find the top of the ice above the rock at the bottom. With this information, we could then decide not only how much ice there was in the basin of Greenland, but also the pattern of the rock beneath the ice. You remember this was the work of the Travis party on the inland ice. This party worked in two groups. One was the surveyors who were measuring the altitude above sea level, and they also measured the value of gravity and the other party who did the seismic shooting. In the course of their work, they traveled about 800 miles across the widest part of Greenland. 800 miles with weasels over a completely barren upland of snow. Three weasels are used by the surveyors. While one weasel travels ahead, the other two stop. Let's watch the procedure from the rear station's point of view. They unpack their theodolite. They can still see the front party, which has also stopped about three miles away. On snow, special precautions must be taken to keep the theodolite tripod level. Over 300 times they must go through this monotonous procedure. Their method is very simple. The two stations are set up about three miles apart. The rear station, or on this diagram, the right-hand station, takes a bearing on the forward station. Meanwhile, at the forward station, a known distance is worked out with a subtense bar at right angles to the line joining the two stations. The angle from this line to the new position is measured at the rear station. By simple trigonometry, the distance between the two stations can now be calculated by the surveyor and his assistant. One of the difficulties of an Arctic survey is the likelihood of extreme optical refraction near the surface of the ice. But by taking readings at both stations and making a comparison by wireless, this difficulty is largely overcome. Now that they know the distance between the two stations, they measure the angle from the higher to the lower station again, by trigonometry, will give us the difference in height. The job completed, the rear party drive about six miles ahead, leapfrogging the first team, and the procedure starts all over again. By this means, we had an accurate cross-section, east-west cross-section of the surface of the ice, which looked something like this. You 
grade level, coastal mountains, east and west, and the ice dome rising to 8,500 feet above sea level at the center. But we still have to determine the pattern of the underlying rock. Two methods were used to do this. One was to measure gravity with a gravimeter and put the reading so obtained into an elaborate calculation and find the thickness of the ice. And the other was seismic shooting, which is rather like echo sounding. The seismic party, too, traveled in three weasels. Every 10 to 20 miles, they stopped to make a sounding. A couple of them go off to set up the explosive charge. With the aid of a long steel pipe with a cutting bit at the end, they drill holes, sometimes to a depth of as much as 20 feet in which to place the charge. After every few turns, the drill has to be pulled out to remove the hard core of snow. Sometimes it is found that suspending the charge in the air gives better results. Meanwhile, another man goes some way off to set up the geophones, ultra-sensitive microphones which are buried in the snow. The geophones can not only pick up the direct sound of the explosion, but also the echo of that sound being reflected off the rock surface beneath the ice. The signals from the geophones are fed through cables to amplifiers, one for each geophone, inside one of the weasels. Here the operator adjusts the level of the signals and records them photographically as a series of waves. When all is ready, the signal is given to detonate the explosive. In this diagram, for simplicity, we have shown only one geophone. Directly after the explosion, a series of sound waves pass downwards through the ice to the underlying rock, where some of them are reflected back to the geophone at the surface. The time interval between the initial explosion and the echo is noted down, and from this the depth of the rock floor from the surface of the ice can be calculated. When all this is over, off they go again for another ten miles or so until the whole of the route has been covered. We now had our two cross sections, that of the surface of the ice and that of the underlying rock. Putting the two together, we had quite an interesting result. As Paul Emil Victor found in the south of Greenland, the underlying rock bears very little relation to the surface of the ice. While the surface is dome-shaped, gradually rising towards the center and falling away again, the rock beneath is depressed in the middle. From this, we can see that Greenland is, in fact, a huge rock saucer filled with snow and ice to a depth of almost two miles. But, and here's a particularly interesting fact. On the survey traverse, the highest recorded point was about 8,500 feet above sea level. The seismic party found that the rock was about 9,000 feet below the surface, so that in places, the rock was, in fact, 500 feet below sea level. At first, it appears that if the snow were removed, the centre of Greenland would become a sort of vast inland sea. This is not, in fact, true. The covering ice crushing down on the Earth's crust is of such enormous weight that it upsets the isostatic balance. Should the pressure be removed, the land would rise by a process of compensation, a matter of between two and 3,000 feet in the centre and will become a vast plateau well above sea level. It is this very question which forms the next step in our investigation. Is the ice, in fact, increasing or diminishing? To find the answer to this question, a vast amount of research was carried out. The methods used are the subject of the second part of this film.